Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, I was just wondering, like, you know, in terms of uh, trade wars or resource war, uh, what do you think is the most valuable resource that you could hold? Salt. Salt? Salt. Oh, that's actually not a bad answer. Yeah, good, yeah good Nathan, I know commodities when I, when I talk about trade wars. Thank you. I was going to go with sugar. I, th- I figured everyone's going to want to be like the Willy Wonka, so they're going to want sugar. Anyway. <laughs> good. We could just go on a diatribe right now about commodities, Nathan. Hey, you know that. <laughs> but I don't think that would be conducive yeah. to the show. No, you know what? We're not going to worry about that because <laughs> luckily, luckily we have somebody on the show who, uh, who might be able to shed some light on this. Uh, I am uh, very happy to have on the show Mike Myler is the uh, author of Trade War which is uh, something for uh, Miss of Akuma and uh, is coming on to Kickstarter very soon. Mike, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Yes. First of all, I'm I'm, I'm very interested in like Miss of Akuma and what that is. So can can you kind of give me an idea of the setting and the game system as it stands? Sure. Uh, Miss of Akuma is a campaign setting for D&D 5th edition and also Shadow of the Demon Lord. Quick way to think about it would be like if you mashed Onimusha and Afro Samurai and uh, Warhammer 40,000 together, or maybe toss uh, some Ravenloft in. Afro Musha 40,000? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except no space. Uh, Miss Fukuma is an Eastern fantasy noir steampunk campaign setting. Like It's very specifically in that order. Um, that, that's a very specific uh, niche of genre right there. It is. It's a little loaded, yeah. So it started off with an idea. I was like, oh, what would have been like if Japan didn't have to like fold when we, uh, America, like rolled up in there with Matthew Commodore C. Perry in 1854 and pointed steel guns at Edo and was like, hey, we're going to be friends now. Um, <laughs> like, how would they resist that? And I was like, okay, well, then if they weren't be able to resist it, like, well, then, okay. Well, if they, so they have magic, so then what would the Americans need to have? And then it became like, okay, well, they have these lightning ships and stuff, and it blew up into this this whole setting. So the basic idea is that um, about 150 years ago in in the setting's history, uh, these lightning-powered, highly advanced machines appeared, and uh, they were piloted by these foreigners that subjugated everybody in Soberin, uh, the continent that that Mississauga surrounds itself with, and uh, drafted all these people into this war across the Great Divide, which is where like um, the sea kind of ends. It ends in this like waterfall and an energy field, and you can't fly stuff through the energy field unless it's powered by technology because it it shuts off magic. So it's closed off from the rest of the world. These technologically superior people show up, subjugate everyone into a war on the other side of the Great Divide, and then about 60 years ago, inside of the game's history, uh, all contact just ceases. Something terrible mm-hmm. happens on the other side of the Great Divide, and like nobody knows what happens. The Kengen occupation continues for like about five decades, and then uh, the emperors. Descendant Toshi Masudo uh, leads a rebellion and like takes back Silverin for uh, the Sapuri, and uh, that's where that's where it begins. But they only get a couple of years of peace before the Mists of Akuma show up, and the Mists of Akuma are these this this supernatural primordial fog that uh, strips people of their dignity, and once they have lost too much of their virtue, they're transformed into a dead oni, which are uh, really fast zombies. Oh, yeah, 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 and it's yeah. worse too because like it's not just people. Um, if you leave out like dead animals or or any animal, it's not dead. Um, that can transform into a specific kind of race. So that's where goblins and hobgoblins come from inside of the setting. Oh, all right, okay. And uh, items too. So like uh, stuff. It, this is something we pulled straight out of Japanese mythology. After a hundred years, uh, an item that you might own or your family has owned could animate itself and then have a disposition equal to how well it was treated. Right. So like your family's treasured umbrella might suddenly, you know, pop eyes in a mouth and start talking to you. It's called a Sukumogami. The Miss of Akuma can accelerate that greatly. And it's the driving force that makes them all afraid of technology because like, oh, yeah, that gun's really great. But you take it into the Miss of Akuma and then suddenly five minutes later, it changes into a monster. It's like biting you and trying to shoot you in the face. And now extrapolate that to like artillery weapons. And there's this societal fear for the most part where everyone's like terrified of technology, like uh, witchcraft almost. So they don't want it to come alive in 100 years and attack them. Well, the Mists of Akuma can speed up the process. So it could oh, be just a year or two years. So dismantle everything when you're done with it. Got it. 
Uh, I mean, it depends on what prefecture you're in. Um, there are four prefectures that champion science. When we were making the game, we and that's why I said it very specific when we describe it, because steampunk is always the last descriptor, because, like, I know a lot of people are tired of steampunk, and they just kind of want some Eastern <laughs> fantasy, maybe some dark Eastern fantasy. And we made it very easy to pull that out of the campaign setting, because, like I said, everyone's terrified of it. Oh, all right. Okay. So it's a role-playing game. Okay. <laughs> I got I got that. Okay, <laughs> good. Wonderful. So Trade War is an adventure path for this setting. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Over the past, I don't know, year and a half, I because um, we, we, we funded Mist of Akuma in 2016 on Kickstarter. Since then, I've written a bunch of adventures for it, uh, six of them. And uh, I, after the first three, I was like, oh, these are all pretty close in level. I could probably tier these so that people could make their own like campaign out of it, starting with, you know, Scourge of Robot, Sheeta Temple, and then play Free Primordial, and then... Uh, Fangs of Revenge, and then uh, Curse Soul of Scorpion Samurai, followed by the Ice Sovereign of Storms, and then Revenge of the Pale Master, six adventures. Takes you up through a bunch of levels. And then um, I, I wrote this supplement. What I sent you guys is the collective thing that has all the adventures with it, right? That's a huge, massive oh, book. It's like 338 okay. yeah, pages or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I saw 330-something pages, and I'm like, it's not going to be a quick read. I pro- <laughs> I'm going to just have to ask him for glyph notes on this. No, 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 yeah. So it's, um, yeah. So I started when I was like about halfway through the third adventure. I was like, oh, okay. So so I started just putting like seeds in there to come back to later. And I wrote, um, a supplement that connects them all together because I know a lot of people already bought all six of the adventures and they don't want to buy another like hardcover. And, um, yeah. So I sent you guys the, the supplement worked in with all the adventures. I feel like I've buried the lead because so you have actually, Miss of Akuma is really your project you started it originally mm-hmm. i have five campaign settings miss of akuma is my third third campaign setting yeah oh okay uh, what were the first two uh the first one is Verantia codex that's for pathfinder and it's published by rogue genius games the second one is hypercore 2099 which is um Paizo had this really great approach to epic gameplay. They made something called Mythic Adventures, which is like a rules template that you throw on the regular Pathfinder rules, and you can play like a, a fifth-level demigod, right? Uh-huh. Um, yeah, it's really cool, but in execution, it kind of fumbles the ball a little bit, kind of makes everybody feel like they're invincible. So we took the opposite mm-hmm. route, and we made like a... If Mythic Adventures smoked a bunch of crack, and that's what <laughs> Hypercore 2099 is. So it's like, the setting is superhero cyberpunk, and there's a rules template that you put on it to make your characters into superheroes. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's available for 5th edition as well. And um, it doesn't work quite as well for 5th edition, so we made 2099 Wasteland, which is, uh, uh, things go very badly in that timeline of the Hypercore 2099 universe, and it's, it's sort of like Fallout for 5th edition. And then um, the last campaign setting came out uh, earlier this year. It's called Book of Exalted Darkness. It is even bigger than this book, if you can believe it. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh my Nathan God. wants to read them all in one afternoon. Yes, I'm going to sit down, get a PDF copy on 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 the tablet. I'm just gonna go crazy. You probably will uh, go crazy. Yeah, <laughs> and find your drooling out of your mouth and just like tapping the keys. You know, Normal Tuesday night for Nathan. <laughs> Normal Tuesday night for Nathan. The second somebody says, "Hey, Nathan, we're gonna play a role playing game," it's like. Just tell me what dice I need and uh, what my character is, and I'm good to go. <laughs> That's all I want. I'll figure out the rest later. Um, I like the idea of Fallout in my uh, Dungeons & Dragons, uh, Dungeons & Super Mutants. I like that quite a bit. Yeah, it's, so. it's, I mean, it's a, it's a departure, because like, um, the, the game, so when you're playing in 29 and Wasteland, it's, it's not actually a campaign set. It's a campaign setting generator, right? So. Okay. You guys sit down, you're like, okay, we're all going to play second level characters, whatever. And then the GM rolls to like randomly determine the resources in the region where you start. And then you have to collect those resources and build a settlement and then explore more regions that are randomly generated using the book. So like okay. everybody kind of gets their own specific wasteland. Interesting. That's, that's pretty dope. And then, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to talk about it too much, but there's like extra sure. classes and races and it's, 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 it's a whole, yeah, it's its own thing. The, there there may be more to that later and then uh then you can come on and talk about that well i'll they, reveal that um if you if the players manage to get out of like if they're playing in miss of akuma and they manage to get across the great divide somehow and i have a group that's like actively working to do that they're obsessed with it that's why i made 29 and wasteland because like all that's on the other side of the great divide is a nuclear wasteland so <laughs> boom 
whoops. <laughs> yeah, I can't oh. wait for them to get over there and find out because they're going to be like, what? We just yeah. spent months building this plane. We can't yeah. get back. That's going to be a fun day. But yeah, we are here to talk about Mists of Akuma. So now, but now I realize that your body of work is uh, varied and plentiful. And so I, I'm fascinated with all of that. Uh, how long have you actually been writing role playing games? I have been a full time freelancer in the RPG industry for all of five years now. You've done a lot in five years. Well, that's the only way to stay afloat, man. You got to swim. You know? <laughs> just keep swimming. Yeah. Or, or just ride on the back of dolphins. I don't. I don't actually publish anything myself. I'm an indirect market bookmaker. So there you go. Other people publish or, or license stuff for me and publish it uh, with my consent, and then they send me money. But it gives me access to a bunch of different markets because, like, otherwise, it's kind of impossible to survive in the five E OGL market unless you're already a legacy publisher or uh, you have the ability to perform. Like, you know, Matt Colville has that YouTube series. Without that, I don't know if he'd have a $2 million Kickstarter, right? Yeah. Exposure is very big, especially mm-hmm. in the tabletop market. You got you to gotta be out there, and you got to do the Finding Dory thing, and you got to keep on swimming. You got to go to Australia? D- yes, Alex, you got to go to Australia. We took a vacation in New Zealand uh, the other year. Does that count? There you go. You did have, like, a Finding Nemo moment. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's fun when we get to trade war because that's what we're actually getting to kickstarter in uh september it's actually two adventures that i'm kickstarting uh trade war is just the one that's already done oh okay uh so i ran a kickstarter for imperial matchmaker you know i think it was march or april or something like that and we got around uh 3500 which is like halfway to goal but i didn't think we were gonna finish so i was like okay time to close it up and i'll reboot this and mm-hmm. since then i've had like i've been working on trade war in my quote unquote free time. <laughs> and um so yeah, we're coming back with a lower lower goal. I think the goal is two thousand nine hundred and forty dollars. And um Trade War's already done, so all that money will just go to uh the Imperial Matchmaker. Trade War's an adventure path, so you could take parts of it and just play it like an adventure, right? Because it's made with six adventures that already exist, right? Imperial Matchmaker, you're gonna have a lot harder of a time just like jumping into it in the middle. Uh you kinda gotta be gotta be in, in Imperial Matchmaker from the beginning to the end. And, and ready for that that kind of commitment. Oh, all right. Okay. When we say trade war, like uh, we might have an idea of what trade war means uh, here, but in the world of Mists of Akuma, what does that actually imply? So the, the underlying thread that's happening with trade war is that there's a... Um, uh, where do we begin? Okay. So the, uh, the reason that all these monstrous races are, are allowed to roll around with all the humans without being like, you know, cut down. And there are a lot of races. There's like 20... If you count all the sub races, it's like thirty something. It's 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 egregious. Ooh, One of them okay. is uh, Bakamono, which are like goblins that are made out of uh, insects that are in the mist of Akuma. So like, there's a spider version of Bakamono where you can change it to like a cloud of spiders and like a cockroach version. And and then the animals that die in the mist of Akuma become or transform in the mist of Akuma become uh, shikome, which are hobgoblins. And the shikome have gathered into these like warrior lodges that embrace technology. So they've got these like badass suits of power armor. They're essentially Space Marines, but in in my Eastern fantasy steampunk world, the reason that their kind are tolerated at all is because they're incredibly good at at killing things. So they'll get hired out by different prefectures and nobles when you know regular samurai aren't cutting it, and that's why Emperor Hitoshi is like, okay, well you guys can stay and you know you're not kill on sight, even though you're clearly monsters from the Mizuku. How this works into trade war is that somebody has been stealing and appropriating and installing their armor cuz the, you don't you can't just put this shit on and wear it and use it like like you you're you know trained with it you have to have these uh, armor contacts things so basically somebody has to install giant metal cartridges into your body they have to not be rejected and then you can use the armor to its, its full capacity um so some mysterious entity starts taking a bunch of these armors and then installing them on like random peasants and this obviously pisses off the Irakotira, and that's that's kind of like the the thread that you follow in between adventures. Like, where's this armor coming from? Who's supplying it? And that's what the trade war is kind of about. It's like they're mad that somebody's stealing this important, uh, protected, uh, copyrighted, you might say, resource of theirs, and and spreading it around to these farmers. That's not actually what what happens at the end. Like that plays an important part. Uh, but like the the end game has to do with this ancient necromancer, and uh, I, don't, I shouldn't give away. Too. It's a facade. 
I will say that it's a song. <laughs> it's all a lie. It's always an ancient necromancer. Always an ancient necromancer. They should do something about them. Kill them? Oh, wait. I guess they kind of do, don't they? He's, I like his name, first of all, and I didn't think of this guy. What my, I, I brought in this dude who got me into, he got me into D&D, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, and I, I you know, convinced him to write this adventure called Revenge of the Pale Master, and it appears at the end of the core, core book for Miss of Akuma, and that's what we, we, we build on. So you get to, you do get to fight the Pale Master, and you might, you might kill him at the end. In the shadow of Honanoroi, Bone Keep uh, is where all these armies finally meet. And you can maybe fight against the Erikotira warriors with like their superpower armor, or you could try to like bribe them or impress them into helping you, or just like not getting involved. And then um, the the big siege happens, and during the siege, you, they make a huge effort to get you, the players, into Honenor Keep. And then you go through nine levels, all of which are based on the Buddhist hells, which, by the way, are fucking amazing. <laughs> um, I, like, I, I must know about these. <laughs> you know what's amazing? Buddhist hell. Buddhist hell. hell. They are. There's no. this one that's just like a flaming, a giant flaming rooster that chases you around. It's like oh, what? Oh, 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 okay. Well, I feel like there's another way you could word that that makes it scarier. But you know, yeah, I, I'll leave it to I'll leave it to your imagination. I, I feel like we have to come back to this and explain, and you have to explain all about Buddhist hells to me. I need to know exactly what these are, and then I can try to avoid them at all costs. But also just get a picture in my head about how amazing they are. Why Why did you get fascinated with the idea of Buddhist hells? <laughs> uh, the writer kind of was dragging his feet. And I was like, okay, Chris, you know, it's been a month, man. Give me, give me an outline. Like, what happens when we get to the bone keep? And he just mm. kept dragging and dragging and dragging. So um, one of the things you'll notice in all the Mr. Kuhn books is that I make prodigious use of ukiyo-e. I'm going to give you a real quick history lesson here. Whew. In, what is it, 1544 or 16, something like that. I think it was 1544. Uh, Gutenberg invents the typeable printing press, right? You guys remember that? Uh, I mean, yes. I wasn't around for it, but yeah. No, obviously. <laughs> we weren't there happening. in person. This happened, while, while this happened over in Europe, over in Japan, they started something called the Tokugawa era of isolation. Uh, that continued for over 100 years where the emperors uh, all declared, like, the only foreigners that we're going to even talk to at all are the Dutch. Everybody else can, you know, fuck off. We want nothing to do with you. So they did not get a Gutenberg printing press until way late in the game. They used uh, lithographs and other, like, type of, of woodblock prints so there's um, a they had a huge literacy problem, you know, during the 1800s because not a lot of people learned to read because you, anything that you read was basically uh, somebody made using calligraphy uh, because there was no typeable printing press. They just had these these you know, block prints. But there is an insane, insane treasure trove of incredible artwork from Japan that is all public domain because it's hundreds of years old. And some of it you look at, you wouldn't even think like that. That, that was older than like 10 years you know mm. it's like oh that looks like somebody in like marvel in the 90s did that oh my god I, that that's kind of why i went to the buddhist hells because like okay well i'm gonna need artwork for this thing and what am i gonna do mm, buddhist hells and also they're mm. awesome like one of them is the 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 lake of blood and pus like come on that sounds like a terrible swimming destination <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big tourist trap these days <laughs> I, I love the imagery. Like, how did somebody come up with that? One day they were like, you know what? You know what would be a terrible lake to envision if you had blood, but also there was like some pus involved in it. Like if you put those two together. A lot of like it. weird ones, like there's a burning hell and then there's a greater burning hell. There's like a screaming hell and then a greater screaming hell. So like, obviously the Buddhist monks got lazy somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they were like, okay, we can't think of anything else. Um, It's just this but worse <laughs> just imagine that it's just the greater or the ultimate what's well, the ultimate burning hell and i think some of it tied into like this uh there's a superstition that has to do with like you're not supposed to give i think stuff numbered in the eights or i'd have to double check there's there's certain numbers of things you're not supposed to give somebody so if you give somebody a bouquet of flowers and there's like 13 flowers in it or something like that that's also that that number the character for the number 13 or whatever number it is that I'm, I'm, I'm misremembering, is also the written character for death. So it's like kind oh. of an insult. And oh. I think that might have influenced why there are, are so many Buddhist hells and some of them are repeats, because like they needed to tie that all together, you know? Oh, okay. So there's some numerology involved in that too. Yes. Okay, excellent. The, uh, the flaming rooster picture that you have sent me is incredible. The world must I know, know of right? this. 
<laughs> the world like, what? The, the world must know of this flaming rooster. We shall tell everyone. Oh my god. There are some people that will be terrified when they see this, but I think most of us will just be absolutely enthralled. I, I mean, it's like um I kind of think about it like imagine if like a dragon and a rooster mm -hmm. just like yeah, they had like a drunken liaison one night and they said, let's make a go of it. And this was their offspring. Both come out of eggs. I'll say that. That's true. And, uh, you know, if like the birds come from like raptors, like dinosaurs, dragons kind of share lizard like tendencies. There's some possibility there. They both got all of them have cloaca. That's true. I'm glad that we are now getting into like fantasy monster reproductive cycles. <laughs> I, I feel like that's what we really need to explore on this episode. It's only been like 20 minutes. I can't believe we got there. So, so we, it, it, you know, it's a. I can't believe it took so long. Yeah. I, I can't believe it has taken us like four years to actually get to this point where we can talk about about this very important. The mating topic. habits of the goblin. <laughs> <laughs> with richard attenborough now on bbc <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> enjoy it will be the new earth series but it will be like middle earth and we'll just uh or Faerun. oh no that's right I've, I've forgotten realms is the default setting alex has reminded me of this okay so uh buddhist hells not a place i want to go and uh flaming uh rooster awesome I'll tell you the ones that because I didn't I didn't just take directly from the Buddhist hells. I, I use them as like models and inspirations because, A, I didn't want to repeat myself and B, I wanted it to be like, you know, I'm making an RPG here. I'm not making a historical document. So there sure. are certain other things I have to keep in mind. So first one is uh, wolves, because that's that's also the first Buddhist hell where you just get ripped apart by wolves. And oh, okay. in mine, they like keep regenerating. So you get through one room of wolves and then you get to the next uh, room and then suddenly the, the bones and stuff fly in and they form into more evil, dangerous wolves rinse and repeat like three or four times. Oh, okay. Uh, the second one is the Hell of Black Ropes, where you have to navigate through these long hallways, and if you fall off the ropes, which are like surrounded by anti-magic fields, so you can't just like fly around them and stuff, uh, and you touch the walls, you, you like lose life force and take damage and so on. And that's the first area where you fight a relic golem, because outside of Honenora Keep, where like this huge battle is raging, because remember, in order to get in, they had to like send a special you know, party of soldiers with you to basically die so you can get inside the keep and attack the Pale Master. So while right. you're going through the levels, you fight uh, four Relic Golems, and each time you defeat a Relic Golem, you destroy one of the, like, uh, magical defenses outside of the Bone Keep and uh, drop one of the Bone Outposts filled with, like, undead legions that are fighting the human soldiers. So you can affect the, the outcome of the larger conflict outside of the, 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 the fortress while you're inside. And you have to do what the first one of those you do on like a giant like lattice work of of ropes where if you fall off you take a bunch of damage. Um, third level is a crushing mortar, which is pretty simple. You just get chased by this like gargantuan iron mortar uh, that tries to crush you. Uh, okay. Fourth level is screaming mausoleums, uh, which is or mausoleums I should say, um, which is exactly as it sounds. And you can skip that one because I like to put in a lot of um, a lot of opportunities for player hubris to screw them over. So, like, you can just totally skip it and keep walking up the stairs. But if you do, when you get to the next level, the Lake of Pus and Blood, um, mm. which there is a new QE illustration for, if you check page 305, it's amazing. Um, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That. yeah. It's much worse for the players if they skip going through the mausoleum circuit. And then the next one's the Hall of Flames, where you fight the giant rooster. Uh, then the Hall of Burning Death, which has a giant black sand cloud, which also I have a QE art for. Oh, yeah, then the Hall of Unending Suffering, and then you finally fight uh, the Pell Master at the top. And then the real fun begins, because you have to deal with that. And the Pale Master is basically like a giant, like, undead necromancer. He's not giant, but yeah, he is a very okay. powerful undead necromancer. He's a powerful me sorry. I didn't mean to imply his size was large, but... Just his, his ego? His ego. His ego is massive. His ego is massive. Okay. And like while you're going through the the, the adventure path, uh, you come across these like black Tory gates. Tory gates are an important part of the the world because um, they've instituted a lot of um, 
territory uh, protection between prefectures. So, like, if you're going between from one prefecture to the next, you have to get travel papers. If you don't, you can get jailed and fined and all kinds of bad shit can happen to you. Mm -hmm. um, but you start running into these black Tory gates that uh, damage you if you try to destroy them, and you find out that the black Tory gates are being used by the Pillmaster uh, for foul ends. I won't say exactly why. But... Yes, that way anyone who's listening to this and thinks this sounds great is not getting a spoiler. <laughs> and no. you clearly don't know how to get around these things now. That's right. Just, uh, just skip to the end of the episode and you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, everything is revealed at the very end of the episode. Just wait. No, it's how we skip spoilers, Nathan. That's true. That's true. We're 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 getting good at this. So in trade war, this is something I am going to have to eventually deal with. Uh, well, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. The theoretically, if everything goes according to plan, uh, th this this is sort of a, a thing that I'm gearing up for. Yeah, I mean, like you can you can destroy a couple of the black Tory gates, and there are rules for going about it. But um, you're not going to find them all. And if you waste your time finding them all, the Pale Master will finish his ritual before you're done destroying them. So Okay. Did, um, did the boot since the Buddhists had like eight hells... 16. Did, 16, sorry. I think it was 16, yeah. There's like 16 hells. Okay. Did, were there any like vacation destinations in, their, in, in, in the Buddhist mythology? Were there like heavens that existed oh. in this too? I'm pretty sure that the, the, the Buddhists had some sort of heavens if you reach Nirvana, yeah. Oh, okay. That would be good. I'm not but a I'm... Buddhist, I should say. I'm a Taoist. So I'm oh, okay. I'm not, I am not an authority on Buddhism, just so we're clear. Okay, okay. That, that's, that's fair. Yeah, if, if, I, I'm not an expert on Taoism, so you, you'd have to. But I, I didn't think that the like, afterlife and realms worked really that way in, in Taoism. It doesn't work quite the... None of the Eastern take the same approach to heaven and hell. And, like, the idea from my, my brief reading about the Buddhist hells was that you go through them, and then it's sort of like a penance, and then you get shuffled back into the reincarnation circle. But you have to be, like, a real piece of shit to get right. sent to one of the Buddhist hells in the first place. Oh, okay. that That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, like a waiting room training seminar for being a better soul. Oh, all right. There's a very good chance that something good awaits me on, in the afterlife in Buddhism. If you're a good person, yeah, you, you, I believe you're supposed to reach nirvana, which is um, like the embrace of the oneness and and uh, peace with all things. All the, and all the peaceful things, too, Nathan. All the peaceful things, too. So I'm guessing that in trade war, I don't see any of that. Oh, hell no. No, no. <laughs> okay. no, no, no. Uh, even if you win the trade war, um, there's another amazing illustration on page 319, which I just can't. I'm, I just it, it's, it's phenomenal to me that somebody hundreds of years ago did this. But like, even if you win and you defeat the Pale Master and stuff, you start to have these like hallucinations mm. where you're just hanging out in nature and then you blink and then suddenly everywhere is just skulls. Yes, I am seeing that. It's right. Uh, that's, like some um, dude, 150, 250 years ago, did that. Like what? That 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 is like the the bunny duck picture, where it's like, no, it's a duck. No, it's a bunny. No, uh, actually, all of those like rocks formations. No, those are skulls, folks. You have to really look at them. Skulls are fantastic pieces of art. The skulls are fantastic, and if you don't notice them right away, it's very shocking. Once you do. Mm. Is this like the uh, the Silence of the Lambs cover photo that was actually done with like nude people? I don't remember that. I never saw that movie. I know they were much you more candid about being nude in Japan before we showed up and changed their culture. Oh my god, Tanuki? Oh, can we spend oh, a quick minute talking about Tanuki? The Tanuki suit. I remember See, the Tanuki that, suit. That's what everyone thinks about when they think about Tanuki. That's and what I think about. Yeah. I don't want to <laughs> So we're gonna take a quick second to hit Google because you need to see. Okay. You need to see okay. this. I'm Maybe. scared but excited at the same. Then it should be a little scared. Yeah. Okay, that's so, good. Anyone who's listening, just Google Tanuki Ukiyo-e. Okay, U K I Y O E. And what you okay. see okay. is, oh man, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna let y'all react first, and you can you can tell the folks what you see. Okay. This is. I uh, wasn't the Tanuki suit the thing Mario wore that looked like a raccoon. Yeah, let's change into a statue. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So if you Google, did you, know you what? 
This is not safe for work. <laughs> it is not safe for work at all. It's not. This is probably not safe for life. I know, honestly. right? But when yeah. we think about Snooki, we think about you know the Mario suit. To be fair. That's a way better thought process for me than that was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. Look it up for yourself. I'm not going to stop you. I uh, I had to cut that conversation a bit short for, you know, our general audience. I figured that was about as much as you wanted to hear. Uh, but good news, if you are a patron on our Patreon page, uh, there is an extended segment uh, where we talked with Mike about uh, Tanuki in... More detail than I thought I ever needed. It is definitely a TMI situation. Uh, there are things I cannot unsee. In the middle of that, though, we did get to learn a lot about Mists of Akuma. Uh, and when we come back on the next episode, we are going to go back into the Mists of Akuma and talk more about Trade War. Uh, Mike is going to give you a real overview of, like this multi-layered path that you go down through through many different story arcs uh, because there is quite a lot going on uh, in this project which is going to be coming to kickstarter in early september so uh, make sure to check that out i will give you a link in the description so that you can uh, check on it it might not have launched by this point uh, but it will make it really easy to get to it when it does launch uh, early in the month, and uh, if you are interested in getting a free PDF, I also have a link for that. And if you want to find out more about Mike Myler, uh, you can go over to MikeMyler.com. That's M-I-K-E-M-Y-L-E-R.com, and uh, he has a wide range of things that may interest you. Uh, and if if you like things, he's got them. So check that out. And you'll be able to find all of that information over on Delvcast.com, along with everything else that we do. And as I had just briefly mentioned before, we do have a Patreon now. And if you are a patron at any level, there is going to be a full, unedited version of this interview which has all the Tanuki goodness that you could ask for. So, hey, a dollar a month. That's, hey, there's like eight minutes that you, uh, that you will never replace for the world right there. I even broke it out into an, its own little audio file if you just want to hear that conversation. I'm a good friend. And while we're on the subject of Patreon, I want to thank our shiny level patrons. Dom and Bonnie, for uh, helping keep the virtual lights on. If you happen to be joining us from a podcast app uh, like iTunes or Google Play, please rate and review and subscribe. We always appreciate that uh, so that you can get the show as soon as it launches. And if you happen to be on Twitter, please follow us. I am at Citanium. Alex is at EXP Limited. And the show is at Delve Podcast. And you can also find Mike at Mike underscore Myler. On the next episode, Mike takes us into a much more detailed account of the Mists of Akuma, as well as telling us about Imperial Matchmaker, uh, which is like the kind of matchmaking that seems violent and deadly. Uh, so, as we do discuss, it's not really like the Jane Austen style of matchmaking, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that on the next episode. Until then, thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye. It does beg the question, why did Nintendo think that was a good idea? To I mean, put it in... was a great idea. They turned it... to, to turn Mario into a statue with a, with a staff. Yeah, but... <laughs> it's weird, it's weird. So, like, I don't know, how much can we diverge? Can I, can I just go, can I talk about Super Mario 2? Yeah, go for it. All right. Doki Doki Panic. That's right, Doki Doki Panic. So, like, there's a whole lot of the heads not knowing what the hands are doing with Nintendo Japan and Nintendo America in the early 90s. And I think that's probably where you're... And I haven't done the research, but that's that's where my gut tells me you're going to find the, the weirdness for Mario's Tanuki suit. I see. Okay. Yeah. That, uh, that, that makes sense. Uh, okay. Cool. I'm good with that. So, Tanuki... No, I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> no, no I'm, I'm off the Tanuki suit. 